Hello, this is the RPG Crawler, and welcome to the first episode of Tabletops and Taverns. This is going to be a new feature on my channel. It is going to be a vlog where I discuss the ins and outs of tabletop role-playing games. I'm going to have a heavy D&D &D focus at first, but I will move on to other systems uh, as time goes by. I will do such things as how-tos, tips and tricks, specific information on particular RPGs, and then generally just various stories that I have from my own role-playing days. Uh, I'm hoping that it will be both informative and entertaining. Uh, this first one, uh, we're going to go ahead and do how do you get into D&D? &D? It's been a, uh, a topic that's been requested of me a few times, so we'll get into that. Uh, first, I want to go into why I call it Tabletops and Taverns. Uh, yeah, there's the the whole play off of the Dungeons & Dragons uh, uh, thing. There, for a long time, a lot of the systems were something and something. In fact, even today, some of the retro clones are called something and something, whatever. Uh, and really, if you think about it, both tabletops and the proverbial tavern in a fantasy setting are places where the characters and the players socially interact. They go ahead and have chats and stories, they tell about their deeds, that sort of thing, and uh, it kind of leads off from there. I hate, I thought it was clever. If you don't think it's clever, then suggest something better. <laughs> um, but uh, for now, we'll go with this. I think, I think it's kind of neat. Uh, back to the uh, episode at hand. How do you get into Dungeons and Dragons? The reason I'm answering this is because I've been asked quite a few times. Um, I know that there's a lot of videos about this to varying degrees. I've already put together a video of how to play Dungeons & Dragons online, but that presumes a certain level of familiarity with the system itself. Uh, so this is actually just going to get you into how to play from a complete newbie... Ex not how to play, but how to get into playing from a complete newbie expect uh, perspective the latest edition of Dungeons & Dragons. Now, um... My experience as a whole uh, is probably going to be very uh, of limited utility. See, I learned Dungeons and Dragons at a very young age. And um, I learned on the version that this particular book came with. This is the uh, basic set from 1984, I think. I'd have to take a look. And what it is, uh, it was a basic starter box set, which I'm actually going to get into later on for the current version. Uh, I got into it when I was very young, and basically, I had to start from scratch, because nobody in my neighborhood really played Dungeons & Dragons, or really, even if they did, would play with a kid like me. So, from day one, I assembled a group of my friends to play Dungeons and & Dragons, and ever since I've been basically been shuffling in and out of groups the same way. Um, as a younger player, that is actually easier to do, and some of, those, some of those aspects of putting together a group are still valid to this day, so I will be adding them to the list. But I've done a little bit of research and found how the modern setup with uh, internet and uh, electronic communications can facilitate group meetings and um, I've gone into that. Uh, I will cover the basics of what you need in terms of uh, materials, actual things that you need to play, and um, how to find the group later on. Okay, let's go ahead and get into materials needed. Now, um, of course, you need the rule set. Fortunately, and this is something that is relatively new, the, the current edition of Dungeons & Dragons is 5th edition. And with 5th edition, Wizards of the Coast, the people that own and put out Dungeons & Dragons, have put together a basic rule set which is available for free online. It is a stripped-down version of the basic characters, the most basic monsters and spells and items that you would need to run a game. It is pretty complete. You, it covers basically... I keep saying basic, and it is basic rules. It covers everything... 
it covers everything that you might run into in a typical game uh, and in fact i believe it covers all of the specific rules to fifth edition uh, you can get it as of this recording at dnd.wizards.com slash articles slash features slash basic rules i will put a link in the description below there are two documents one for players which describes four basic character classes uh, some very uh, the most common races uh, and the most common abilities. Um, there is a, a separate booklet for the dungeon master that basic that has I keep saying basic, but it is a basic book has all of the rules that you need to actually get a game up and running, including monsters, some items, and the combat and interaction rules. So all you need in terms of rules are what in those or what are in those books. Now of course as you go into depth you'll want to pick up the full rule books and I will get to those in a little bit. But that means that the current cost to enter a to you know the the current investment to enter a Dungeons and Dragons game as long as you've got a computer with internet access is zero so far. Um another minimum materials dice or some sort of dice roller. Now, the uh, Dungeons and Dragons system uses what are called polyhedral dice. They're designated by a D and then the number of sides. So you're, when you're talking about it, you're, you will, so you'll refer to it as a D4, a D6, and so on and so forth which is basically how many sides are up. These dice are used for different things. They're used for generating character statistics, determining the success or failure of actions, determining how much damage you or your spells may do, and things like that. They're used for a wide variety of tests within the game. Now, uh, the basic dice that the Dungeons & Dragons game uses are the D4, the D6, the D8, the D10, the D12, and the D20. The D20 is the one that you're going to be using most often. However, the one that you'll probably want multiples of, if you're going to get multiples, is most likely either uh, most likely the D6, followed by probably the D8 or the D4, depending on what class you use. Uh, you can get by with just one set, but having multiple D6s will will cure a lot of uh, cure a lot of ills. Um, now you can use a, in most instances, if you're just going for the absolute basics, uh, you can use a random number generation app. Now you can get these for your phone, uh, a lot of dice roller apps for your, for your phone, Android, and I believe on iOS. I know I've got a very good one called Dice Bag or something that's on my Android phone right now. Um, some, some groups will not let you use them. But if you're just playing a casual game and you have no dice and you're just learning to get into it, then it'll work just as well. Now, there is a free dice roller on the Wizards site itself. It's www.wizards.com slash dnd slash dice slash dice.htm. And it's actually for an older edition, but dice don't change that much. One thing to note, if you're going to get dice from a hobby shop or something similar... You, uh, I believe they call them gaming shops now. That, that dates me right there. That tells me how how long how long I've been playing the game. Uh, there are other dice that they sell now. The odd numbered dice, like the D seven and so on and so forth, they're pretty rare to find. They're mostly used for other gaming systems. You will almost never use them in D and D unless your unless your dungeon master has come up with something custom. Um. There used to be like a D100 because there is a D100 roll in D&D. And there's a lot of Ds in this sentence, I know. Um, I don't know if they make them anymore because they're, they were a pain in the ass to use. They would just roll and roll and roll because with 100 sides, it was basically a, a big ball. Um, most often, to generate a D100 roll, you will roll two 10-sided die of different colors. And before you roll, you'll designate one as the tens place. 
So that'll give you a number between 0, 1, and 0, 0, which is 100. Some D10s will actually have a the the 10-sided, uh, the tens place printed. So instead of a 1, it'll show a 10 on the side, and then a 20 on the side. Those are fancy. Not necessary. If you're going to get multiple dice, two D10s ought to cover it for D&D. &D. And that's just for the whole percentile die, the percentile D100 rolls. All right. That covers dice. Then what do you need last? Um, pen and paper or some sort of notepad on your computer. This is, as I said, this is the absolute bare minimum. Pen and paper or a, a notepad application is a very useful for taking notes, but it's most critically used to keep records. Each player is going to have to have a character record sheet with their character's ability scores, their other, you know, their other character abilities and traits on it, their equipment, their money, and so on and so forth. And there's going to be a permanent record either for that set for that session or spanning over multiple sessions. A lot of DMs will have either a player character application, uh, player character sheet application that you can use, or actual printed player character sheets. Uh, and we'll get to, into that when I go into the very specifics. Now, if you've decided that you actually want to drop some money on the game, then um, there's several options. If you're just looking to start out and you want to try out the game with a pre-made adventure, the basic rules printed out, and all of the very fundamental things that you need to play the game, then the 5th edition starter set is where you want to look. It's got a pre-written adventure called The Lost, Man Lost Minds of Fandelver, you can get it on Amazon. I believe it has dice. I believe it has basic maps. I'm not sure about the dice. I'll have to take a look. Um, it should have tokens in order to uh, show where your character is on the map, which are optional, completely optional, but useful if you're using a battle map. Um, but it's actually a very, very solidly put together little set, and it introduces you to Dungeons & Dragons very well. So if you have a group together that nobody has ever played... And you want to start off with just seeing how the game runs, then that starter set is great. If, however, you're either joining an existing group or you're already confident in th the fact that you want to play the game in a particular role, then you will be wanting to get one or all of the core rule books. Now, the core rule books, there's three main core rule books, and then there's additional books for particular adventure groups. Um, but we'll be focusing on just the three core rule books. The first that everybody is going to need is the player's handbook. The player's handbook contains the core rules to create and play a character of any of the core races and core classes. This has many more rule or many more classes, many more races and many more spells than the basic rules do. It provides backgrounds, feats, more equipment, an extended spell list, and a lot of inspiring artwork to be truthful. Um, Every player that's a serious D&D player will want at least the player's handbook. If you don't ever intend to be a dungeon master, you don't need to worry about the next two books. But I'm going to go into them anyway because somebody in the group has to be the dungeon master. Next is the dungeon master's guide. This is the one that you'll want to get if you know you're going to be the dungeon master, but you aren't really sure what you need to do. Now the Dungeon Master's Guide contains guidelines for world creation. It can, and because the Dungeon Master is the one that effectively puts the world together for the players, even if you're using a pre-written campaign setting, you're going to want to know uh, the basic backgrounds 
of that campaign, of that world, and you'll want to know how to improvise for specific parts of the setting. Uh, it contains variant rules. It contains um, rules for the treasure and magic items. It's got a long list of magic items uh, that you can put in your game. It's a very solidly put together book. I recommend it for all dungeon masters. Uh, you can get by as a dungeon master with just the basic rules, but if you want a long running campaign, you're going to really want this book. The last of the core books is it wants the most optional and yet one of the most commonly purchased, and that is the Monster Manual. The Monster Manual is nothing less than a catalog of monsters that you can put in your game. Monster books have always been very, very popular, even amongst people that don't play the game, simply because they have a lot of artwork of the monsters in them. Um, you can get by with just the monsters from the basic set. If you're running a pre-designed adventure, a lot of times they will have the monster statistics in the adventure in line. Sometimes they'll have abbreviated forms of them, but they'll have enough to run it nine times out of ten. The monster manual lets you create get, uh, create adventures and the world from uh, the world's monster population from scratch. It's a very solid book. It does what it, it is exactly what it says on the tin. It's just monsters, lists and lists of monsters. Uh, always in the past, they've put out additional monster manuals. I don't know um, where that stands in 5th edition. I would like to see more monster manuals. I know that there's a third-party one out there that's very, very good, but I'm not going to get into it because this is just a, a basic introduction in, in what you need to play D&D. Now, if you are spending money, then yes, get dice. Don't use an app. Get dice unless you're playing purely online. Um... You're going to want more than just pen and paper if you're actually starting to spend money on it. Uh, as a dungeon master, the minimum you'll want in addition to the pen and paper is if you're, if you're running any dungeons, you're going to want some sort of graph paper. Any basic graph paper will do. Um, it's useful for sketching out a map of the dungeon. Um, you can do it with online stuff, but I find it easier to just use pen and pencil or a, or a pencil and in the graph paper. Um, not everybody's going to need to use that graph paper, but it's useful to know. Uh, the reason people use graph paper for mapping is so that you have a fair idea of the size of the car doors, because you can say one square equals five feet or one square equals ten feet, and then very easily measure out distances when you're in a dungeon or in a town or whatever. Another commonly used type of paper that uh, beyond graph paper and basic paper is hex paper and that's mostly for outdoors uh, grid or outdoor crawls there you can make a hex grid and, and it's basically uh, it's just like graph paper except um, instead of squares you'll have hexagons set up and that's mostly used for world maps and area maps um, it's used to a, it's, it's used to a lesser extent now simply because the way the game has evolved but it's if you're going to do a lot of outdoors adventuring and you don't want to mess with anything else then a hex pad can be very useful uh, some people use start investing and they get into roll up battle maps dry erase boards that sort of thing they can be incredibly useful as well you can get battle maps with the grid already printed out and it's already in uh, a a scale that you can use miniatures on. Um, I wouldn't recommend getting it just right off the bat, but if you do a lot of tactical combat in your game, uh, they can come in useful. I don't. I've been playing since the '80s, and I don't own one, but I've used them when other people have brought them around, and uh, they're 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 pretty handy to have. Uh, other optionals: um, miniatures. A miniature, if, you, if your DM or your group is using miniatures in their game, uh, they can help you visualize the character. They can help you keep track of it during combat. I've used them, but I haven't really invested in many of them. Uh, it was never a big part of my campaign. That's more for a tactical campaign. I usually do like theater of the mind style campaigns. And this is all terminology that we'll get into at a later date.
Uh, but just know that the stuff that I'm listing, if it sounds overwhelming, a lot of it is very optional. Um, you know, and in, in one of the one of the other further materials that some people are getting into now are campaign managing software. This is where the dungeon master can enter all of the NPC details, the maps. They can keep the handouts ready in the software. I just use a three ring binder. Software is great if you're going to use it at the table. Um, I can't complain with that. So, now that the basic materials are out of the way, let's take a look at the people. In order to play Dungeons & Dragons, you're going to need at least a bare minimum of two people. One is going to be the Dungeon Master. The other is going to be a player. It is preferable to have a larger group. The ideal party size in Dungeons & Dragons, wherein most of the adventures that are pre-written are designed for, is between four and six people. A lot of groups can get by with less. Back in the day, uh, back when I, was, uh, when I was first playing, it was not uncommon to have a party size upwards of eight or ten people. Over the years, that average party size has come down quite a bit because simply with 8, 10, 12 people, it is very difficult to get schedules to all coincide at once. Um, so a lot of groups simply use the 4 to 6. Now with less players than that, uh, you have a problem with monsters and encounters in pre-written modules being designed for that four-person party as a bare minimum. So you'll have a lot more difficulty with just one or two players. Uh, you won't have many chances to pull their pull their butts out of the fire if things get real hairy. Uh, you know, once things start going south with only a couple with only two one or two players, then uh, they go south real quick, real fast. Um, most of the pre-written modules are designed for the four to six player group. Uh, as, for, as for players and DMs, well, you th say everybody, uh, everybody at the table is a player, and technically, yeah, they're all playing the game. But player in Dungeons & Dragons specifically means a person who is not the Dungeon Master who runs a player character. That is the person behind the character, the person that is acting, you know, saying what their character does at the table. One person at the table... In particularly large games, there may be two or three, but usually just one person at the table is the Dungeon Master. The Dungeon Master is not, you know, completely... I mean, they're technically completely omnipotent, but if they go ahead and, and if they're an ass, their group's not going to... their group's not going to skip stick together long. The Dungeon Master is specifically the individual that adjudicates the rules plays the reactions and actions of the non-player characters. This includes everything from your villagers to your tavern keeps to your quest givers to your monsters to your random encounters. In an extended campaign, the dungeon master is also the individual that designs the world. Now, even if they're using a pre-written campaign world, they're the individual that defines the specific details because no campaign box can go into it you know, every single villager's house detail some have tried some have tried believe me the some have tried but you, generally speaking they'll describe a village and then it's the up, up to the dungeon master to flesh it out on the fly or flesh it out beforehand as necessary so those, those are the basic roles at the table now how do you get a group of players for Dungeons and Dragons. Well, if you're lucky enough to know players, you can always join an existing group. If they are looking for players and you know where to find them, then there you're in. I mean, even if you've never played Dungeons and Dragons before, most groups will be generally helpful, especially if they're short a player. With the caveat that some groups are short a player for a reason. So if you've, you know a, a group that's always perpetually been short a player, despite there being a lot of uh, a lot of players available, keep that in mind. Sometimes they're short a player for a reason. 
Um, but generally speaking, if you if you live next if you live near a uh, gaming shop, you know that they're playing there a lot. Uh, you can find uh, you know you can find a group. So joining an existing group is the number one way. Uh, if you do not have an existing group to join, then you're going to have to assemble one. Uh, you can form a group with your friends and or your family. I generally don't play with family. Number one, because few of my my own family is interested, and number two, it can lead to very odd situations at times. But you know, it works great for a lot of it works great for a lot of people. Uh, you're more likely, especially if you're in a younger age group, to be able to find you know to be able to go out and ask your friends if they have any interest in fantasy, even if they. It's a lot easier nowadays because the fantasy role-playing games, especially on computer, are so widespread that it's actually a lot easier to find people that are interested in that might be interested in giving D and D a try, even if they've never played it before. Um, just with the the whole vein of fantasy movies, fantasy games, uh, it's become real common in the culture. And you know, when I was a kid. Yeah, good luck. You were you were lucky to find even one or two people. But nowadays, it should not be too hard. As long as you've got a fairly large circle of friends, you should be able to find some that play D&D. &D. Uh, if you have no friends, I'm very sorry for you. Uh, but there are options, even if you are a friendless individual. Uh, if you are in a school, I, I, I'm hesitant to touch upon this because I assembled a lot of groups in my school when I was very younger. Uh, but I understand that things have changed and schools have become a lot more strict in a lot of places. So be advised, this is not a, you know, this is, use your judgment based on your own school uh, school setting. But generally speaking, schools, you know, universities, high schools that you're in, don't go hanging around, <laughs> don't go hang around a high school if you're, if you're my age, uh, unless you got a very good uh, reason to be, uh, then... Yeah, if if you're currently in school, bam, there's your source of players here you can draw draw from. There's always going to be a group, even if they don't advertise openly, that plays D and D, unless you're way way out there. Um, let's see. Aside from schools, ah, local gaming stores. I've already touched upon this. If you if you know a local gaming store and you you frequent it often. You frequent your if you frequent your local gaming store often, you're probably not watching this video except you know as a lark. But if you have a local gaming store that sells Dungeons and Dragons and supports in-store gaming, a lot of times they'll have some sort of bulletin board up there that'll show you whether there's any groups in the local area that are looking for games. Uh, they may show you times when games are played in the store because a lot of them allow it. A lot of them allow uh, games to be played in the store. Uh, worst comes to worst, you can always ask the clerk, hey, do you know any gaming groups that are looking for people? You're never going to find a gaming group if you don't take that step and ask and look around. You know what I'm saying? Uh, another option, if you do have a local gaming store, is organized play. Now, this is not available everywhere, but it's pretty widespread. Organized play are things like the Adventurers League, things like that, where they have documented characters that you can switch from table to table and play existing modules on a set day. I'm not a fan of them. I haven't played in a lot of them. In fact, I haven't played in any in years and years and years ever since it was, you know, a very much earlier edition. Uh, but if you've got no choice and you just want to try the game out, uh, it can give you some exposure um, just to the way that the game runs. Let's say you're trying, you know that you're already going to form your own group, but you would like to get a taste of the play beforehand, then organized play is an excellent way to do that. Um, I can't really comment much more on organized play because I do tend to avoid it like the plague. But, but hey, if if you need if you need an example of what to do, and in some cases an example of very much what not to do, uh, you know that's a clear cut way to do it. And finally, um, online resources. Now I have, as I've said, produced a video, and I will try to put a link in the description below that covers playing D&D &D online. 
Um, but aside from that, even if you don't want to play online, there's still online resources where you can find a group. Uh, you know, the basic social networking sites, Facebook and so on and so forth, can set you up. I'm not sure how safe these things are. There's no guarantee that you're going to go on there and not be, you know, find somebody really weird. But uh, but they're there, and a lot of times they're very friendly. Uh, you know, Facebook groups. There's a a D and D section of of meetup. Uh, I know that I, I think there may be a group like a subreddit on Reddit. That is nothing but looking for D&D groups, um, whether online or real life, I'm not sure. Uh, there's a site, nearbygamers.com. I'm not sure how accurate that is. But all of these sites have areas where you can try to find local gamers. And I'm sure that there's a bunch more out there. So, you know, worst comes to worst, you can always look at one of those sites, try to find a group near you, and go to it. If you're in, uh, you know, the Americas, uh, if you're in Western Europe, you're probably going to have a lot better time finding a group than some places. But uh, from what I've seen, a lot of these online solutions, they, they, they've got groups meeting all over the world. So, you know, you never know until you try. So, now that you've found a group... It's time to decide whether you're going to be the dungeon master or a player. Most people, they're going to start out as a player. Mostly just because it takes one person to be the DM for every four or five people that are players. Um, even a DM is going to want to play sometime or another, trust me. I got roped into being the DM in most of my games. I relish the days where I can actually sit down and just be a player and somebody else covers the DMing responsibilities. Uh, what makes a good player? First of all, and a lot of these are going to sound like basically how to succeed at life because it's true. It, the Dungeons & Dragons game is a social experience. So you're going to want to pe treat people with courtesy. That's number one. You don't have to just you don't have to go overboard but it, basically don't be a dick <laughs> treat people with respect they're there to enjoy themselves so are you you know be be a be a courteous individual be punctual D, &D games generally start on an agreed upon time don't be too late if you're going to be too late, if you're going to be late, let them know. Don't just show up willy-nilly whenever. That throws the whole flow of the game off. Especially if it's a group that will wait until everybody's there. I know personally, if somebody's too late for one of my games, I'm going to start without them and just NPC them in the background until we figure out what the hell's going on with their player. Some groups will actually delay until everybody's there, so let them know if you're going to be late. Um, be attentive if you are playing a long game. This has been especially a problem back in the old days where I had a larger group. But uh, don't be sitting there playing on your phone or playing a game of Magic the Gathering or something until it's your turn. And then look up and be like, what, what, what's going on? No. Pay attention. Whether it be in combat, whether it be while the dungeon master is describing something you don't want to be that guy that sits back there in their own world and the dungeon master is telling how dangerous a cave looks or whatever and everybody's hesitating to go in and you're the one that goes like oh yeah okay i go into the cave you're gonna get your ass beat <laughs> and you're gonna slow down the game if you take too long. If you look up and just, you haven't even figured out what you're going to do for your next combat round yet because you've been off shooting the shit or, or playing Magic the Gathering. I say that specifically because it used to be very common when I was young for them to be playing a collectible card game while their turn was not up. You don't want to be that person. Be knowledgeable. Now, this is not saying be a rules lawyer. You don't have to know every rule. You don't have to know every detail. But if you have a character with a certain number of special abilities, have an idea as to what those abilities do. If it's your first time playing, take a moment and read the particular rules, at least for your particular abilities. 
even if you don't know the full rules, because generally speaking, a lot of the game is really the equivalent of improv acting, the specific rules can be described to you, the, or the, the general rules can be described to you on the fly. The specific rules of your character, what kind of attacks they have. If you're a wizard, what kind of spells do you have memorized? You're going to want to know them. So just take a, look, take a moment, familiarize yourself with what your character can do. It'll save everybody a lot of time, and there's nothing worse than asking somebody, oh, what does your character do? And they're saying, hold on, hold on. I don't know what I'm doing because I have no idea what any of these spells do, for instance. And last, and this is not an absolute must, but it will be very helpful both to yourself and to your fellow players. Be descriptive. Now, you don't have to say an entire novel every time you do an action, but if you're saying... Oh, my fighter approaches the goblin and attacks. Roll the die. That is going to get really old really quick. You don't have to make it long. Just add a little bit of flair. Uh, yes, uh, Grimblade walks up to the goblin. Pulls his broadsword out, spins it in his hand, and attempts to plunge it through the goblin's chest. That will put a little meat on the bones for other people to interact with. This is especially important in non-combat interactions because there's it, even in at least in combat you've got the basic die roll to respond to. In non-combat situations, I know I've got a I've got a uh, got a person in one of my tabletop groups. Really nice guy. Always there to play, has a real bad habit of barely describing anything. And a lot of times, we've had to stop to figure out where his character was because he's just basically been on autopilot for half the adventure. And they, we ask him, well, and he'll chime in, and people will go, oh, I didn't realize your character was there. Because the last I heard, you know, he was waiting at the corner. Oh, yeah, well, I just assumed that he'd follow the follow you around. You have to state it. You have to go ahead and give people something to work off of. And, and, it, and it'll really help the entire group get along better. So now you're familiar with being a player. There's a long way to go. But for now, we're going to look at the Dungeon Master. Being a DM. You are the person responsible for running the game. As a player... It's going to be helpful to be courteous and be punctual. These are basic attributes that anybody engaging in a social activity should understand. Make sure that you've mastered the basics. Be courteous, be respectful, be punctual. For a dungeon master, however, they have additional responsibilities. You must be fair. Now this, in, this means that you should enforce the rules fairly in order to provide a fun experience for everybody. If you're a complete pushover, then people will enjoy themselves less simply because there's no challenge, no risk, and no real drama in the game. If you're too strict, if you're too demanding, then people will enjoy themselves for the will, will fail to enjoy themselves for the opposite reason because they'll think you're a dick basically and they'll take on an antagonistic role and that's not where that's not where you want to be. Your job there is to enforce the rules fairly, to give the players a chance and to make sure that people have fun. Uh, you will want to prepare. Preparation is the dungeon master's big secret. If you are running a pre-prepared module and you at you know, you don't have to necessarily make the world or the encounters behind it. You're still going to want to at least give that module a read through so you're not surprised with anything that might pop up later. If you are making your own adventure and your characters have an option of going into various ruins and such, you'll want to prepare at least the very beginning so that if they peek into like a hidden store or a hidden, that was a bad word, it's a bad choice of words, if they peek into a hidden cave 
or you know a, a random temple that they find as they go along you'll want at least enough written down and or prepared so that you can inst or you can not instantly but immediately come up with what they see what they experience what they find a little bit of preparation goes a long way you don't have to detail out every house but having a few stock you know very, a few stock maps on hand goes does wonders i personally have a couple stock maps that i use uh having a quick lookup table for npcs is very useful you never know what the player characters are going to do I was running one uh, just recently where the player characters decided to que actually keep a goblin alive and question him. And this was not provided for in the module, so I had to come up with the, characters, with, with the, with the goblin's name and personality off the fly. Uh, you never know when they're going to take a particular interest in a, in a merchant or, more likely, you know, a random barmaid or a random peasant. They're going to pick one off the road and decide to question him decide to ask their name, their job, that sort of thing. You're going to want to have something on hand to give that NPC a distinct personality and a distinct look. This will lend a lot of life to your game, so not everybody appears to be a clone. You'll want to keep records. Now, as a dungeon master, this is more important if you're running a long-term campaign, but it's important nonetheless. You will want to keep records of NPCs that the characters took a special interest in because you never know when they're going to come back to them. You're going to want to take records of how they reacted to certain quest NPCs. Let's say they were a real they were real assholes to the Duke. The Duke's going to probably remember that. If they come up to him again, there's going to have lasting consequences. Make sure that you keep records of afflictions that are affecting your characters because they have a bad habit players have a bad habit of forgetting forgetting them make sure you keep records of unidentified or otherwise unknown items that the the players pick up you're going to want to know where they found them and what they do this is important because a lot of times a player will go ahead and pick up an item not realize it's important not realize it's a valuable and throw it in their pack and then six months later, when they're cleaning up their character sheet after like dozens of adventures, they'll turn around and they'll say, hmm, I've got a white onyx key in my back. I wonder what that fits. Is it magical? Hey, DM, I'll go ahead and detect magic on it. Now, if you haven't taken notes as to what that, what that key does, then, you know, you're SOL. You may have forgotten it by then. You may have to look through all the adventures that you've run. Quickly, flipping back through, you know, pages and pages of everything. Whereas a simple note of loot that the characters, you know, a simple list of loot that the characters have found that has not been identified yet, go a long way towards fixing that. Um, and last but not least, as a dungeon master, be descriptive. As descriptive, if not more so than the players. It's your job to portray the world. It's your job to describe encounters well enough that the player, the players have a grasp on what's going on. If the players regularly lose themselves in your combats, if they regularly lose themselves in your room descriptions, then it's a good bet that you're not being as descriptive as you need to be. Now, this does not mean make a book. As I said before, succinctness being able to paint a picture uh, paint a particular picture with a few words is important it's more important than being flowery and 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 having these you know i hate to use the term gagaxian but if you've ever read any of his descriptions in terms of his, the the uh, pre-prepared modules he wrote then you'll know what i'm talking about uh it's very flower so, some of his very very convoluted languages and it can it can make a difference in how a character perceives a room and whether they miss important important aspects of it. I had the character completely miss the fact that there was no grate over the pit in the floor. There was a like a, a lip where a grate was supposed to be and he had assumed that the the grate was still in it and so he walked over the pit. And everybody was like, what? No, no, I walk over the pit because he thought there was actually a grate on the pit. 
So, you know, eventually he fell in. But uh, it's important that you keep your descriptions clear enough so that most of the players, not all of them, but most of the players at least understand what's going on. And uh, if you get those down, you're well on your way to becoming a, a fair DM, you know. Uh, just uh, there, there are specific tips and tricks, which I will go into in another video. But for now, you know, you've got a pretty good grasp. Or you've got at least the starting materials as to what you will need to do. Um, I will do more videos. If, if, if you like this, I will do more videos of specific tips and tricks that you can use as a player or a dungeon master in future videos. Um, there is a lot to learn, even after so many years of playing the game. I am still learning trip tips and tricks. There is, I mean, if the instant you stop learning is the instant you die, right? You're always looking to get more information, refine your skill, because it is, you know, role-playing is a skill, and you will get better with it over time. Um, but I think I'm going to wrap it up here. I've been rambling on for as long as, you know, a little bit too long. If you like this new series, remember to like. Leave me a comment, because I intend to do more of these on a wide variety of topics. And remember, subscribe for more RPG content. Until next time, take care and goodbye.